Yeah, I'll get you set up. There's a, some spots right up here. It's a hot spot right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real hot spot. <laughs> okay. So you're on the air. All right, we're live. So we're truly, we're truly honored for this um, auspicious visit. This, this happened in the last week or so. And um, I'm just going to read a little bit about our special guest. A renowned teacher of the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Here Dayananda Swami, or H.D. Goswami Das, received his Ph.D. in Sanskrit and Indian studies from Harvard University and has lectured at universities around the world at the forefront of contemporary religious dialogue. H.D. Goswami is celebrated for his unique ability to adapt the wisdom of ancient Indian philosophy. I got some of this from your website. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't write it. I didn't write it. It's well, very well written. Uh, adapt the wisdom of ancient Indian philosophy into teachings that are comprehensible for Western audiences. A lifelong practitioner of bhakti yoga, that's pretty good. Lifelong practitioner of bhakti yoga, or the yoga of love and devotion, he is currently developing Krishna West, a project dedicated to making Bhagavad Gita's ancient spiritual wisdom accessible and user-friendly in Western countries. H.D. Goswami has published several books, including the highly lauded A Comprehensive Guide to Bhagavad Gita with Literal Translation and Quest for Justice, Select Tales with Modern Illuminations from the Mahabharat. And both of those books are in the back. And I have been recommended by at least a dozen of my various teachers to read this book on the Bhagavad Gita. So I, I highly encourage you to, to read this book. Because for the who here has read parts of the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, sometimes difficult, often deeply illuminating. This book has been really, really helpful in my spiritual path and in, in diving deeper. And I want to say personally, listening to Maharaj's lectures and reading his books has been very helpful for me in understanding um, the complexities of bhakti yoga, of the Vedic system, in ways that are practical, down to earth, often humorous, and st still true to their, their um, deep and fascinating wisdom. So thank you so much for gracing us with your presence, Maharaj. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. And thank you all for coming. So, I will now try to be illuminating. Um, topic, what was it, our, tonight's topic? I believe it was something to the effect of what it's like or the ability to practice the spiritual Taking on spiritual practices in the modern age. Yeah, the, you, you could say the challenges, especially in this age. It's probably not the most spiritual age in recorded history. So, um, I think I'll begin by talking about some of the challenges to anyone that wants to practice spiritual life seriously in any age, in any part of the world. And then perhaps we can talk about some of the uh, special, special challenges of the age we live in now. Um, first of all, what are we doing here? I mean, you know, in material bodies. That's actually the first lesson of the Bhagavad Gita that we are actually spiritual beings. And also in the Yoga Sutras by potentially, which you probably know about, uh, of course, the Yoga Sutras begin, Atta, Atta Yoga Anushasa, now really the authorized teaching on yoga. You've all heard of the Yoga Sutras, read it. Shasana means teaching, and from the same root, Shas, which means to command. You have the word Shastra, which is generally the word used for scripture in Sanskrit or just any authoritative book. So Shasana has the sense uh, not only of the teaching, uh, but it has a sense of an authoritative teaching. And anu, that nice little prefix anu, in Sanskrit means uh, following. And so anushasana indicates that <clears throat> Patanjali, 
is basically declaring that he is about to give an authoritative teaching on yoga following the previous masters. He's not going to make this up. And so all that's in the word Anushasanam. And Atta just means now, <laughs> yoga Anushasanam. And then after ha having declared the topic of the book, he, of course, states, well, he defines yoga. He, he explains what yoga is. And he says, uh, yoga is chitta vritti nirodha, which, anyway, I don't want to sound like a Sanskrit snob and say a lot of the translations I've seen are, um, anyway, I won't be a Sanskrit snob. But uh, yoga, the definition of yoga is uh, chitta vritti nirodha. Uh, chitta means the mind or consciousness. And uh, vritti in Sanskrit Vritti means uh, turning, literally. That, so in Sanskrit, I like to start with the very root meaning. And then if someone suggests an idiomatic sense of a word, uh, but it, it comes from the root. It's good to stay organic here and, and, and come out of the root. So the root is turning. And, and it's actually pronounced technically in Sanskrit, Vritti. And we still have it in English. English is an Indo-European. I won't do this all night. I mean, all this uh, historical linguistics, so don't panic. Anyway, but but he, Patanjali defines yoga as chitta, the mind, vritti, the turning. We still have this vert, the, this word meaning to turn in as, as an English stem in words like invert, to turn in. Turn inward, extrovert, one who turns outward, or uh, pervert, one who kind of turns something into a mess and uh, subvert to turn something down revert to turn again to something so anyway english is an indo-european language and even the structure of it's very similar to sanskrit so we still have that root vert and and that the reason i mention that is because that's how patanjali defines yoga nirodha means stopping checking stopping something blocking it and uh so chitta vritti nirodha in a literal sense, means that you stop the mind from turning away from the truth. And you bring the mind back to the truth. Uh, I'll say a few words about the yoga system, because in a sense, um, you've all heard of Ashtanga yoga. Ashta is just ocho, you know, eight, the eight limbs of yoga. And um, because the diff in, in a sense, Ashtanga yoga, uh, Anga, of course, just means limb. Ashtanga Yoga, uh, although it has lots of technical features that people really don't do so much nowadays, although they use an Ashtanga Yoga because it, you know, anyway, it sells. But, but um, if you look at all these eight features, you can see that even if we're not doing a very technical ancient yoga process strictly, but still in our own way, we have to do all those things to be spiritually successful. And so I'll explain that. So there's there's a universal quality to these eight features of yoga, eight steps of yoga. So the first one, of course, is yama, and uh, which which means a rule, sort of like rule and regulation, yama niyama. And these involve moral things, like you know, you have to be a moral person. You have to, you can't just be grossly self indulgent. You have to be virtuous, because as Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, if we don't act virtuously, if we go down to the next guna or quality, which is passion. Passion here doesn't have the positive sense as in modern English, like my passion is, I don't know, ornithology or something. It's, um, it's not that sense of passion. It's passion in the sense of being selfish and just like being so worked up over something that you just roll over other people or you... Um, you're not calm, you're not thoughtful about what you're doing, you're just like hyped up. So that, that's the sense of it in Sanskrit, Rajas. So um, you have to calm down. So, so non-virtuous activities, activities which are selfish, which harm other people, uh, they disturb the mind, they disturb us and, and it's not possible to meditate. So one has to be a good person and have sort of the tranquility, the inner peace that comes with virtue. Because that inner peace only comes with knowing that you're not harming other people, that you're that you're being a good person to the best of your ability, and that brings peace. And peace allows you to 
to practice yoga. So yama, niyama, interestingly the word yama, which means restraint, also is the name of the Lord of Death in this ancient worldview. So yama rods, you know, the, it was sort of like the person that, um, I don't know, spanks you, you know, delivers <laughs> bad karma. So the idea is you can voluntarily do this or, you know, anyway. So yama, niyama, then asana. You all know asana, it just means and the reason uh, the yogis had to learn asanas is because they would sit and meditate for a very long time and you can get horrendous cramps. And, you know, it's you really have to condition your body to be able to sit for a long time and practice yoga, hence the asanas. And then pranayama, of course, the breathing exercises. Um, and in Sanskrit, prana, which means, the, you know, the life air, also sometimes means the soul or life itself because... Sort of like the vital air that keeps you alive in your body. And so it's, I mean, nowadays we use words like core. But so, so the idea of prana is really getting to the deepest core of your, of your at least your uh, psychosomatic human existence. Now, what you may notice about all these four is that they're all kind of preparatory. Because you haven't meditated yet. You haven't really launched into the inner world of meditation, you're just getting yourself ready physically, mentally, emotionally, and you know, controlling your breathing. And so you're conditioning your body, your mind for what you're going to do next. And so the next thing is pratyahara. Um, so prati, prati in Sanskrit is a prefix which means something like counter, like for example. Uh, if someone attacks you, that's yudha, then pratyudha, counterattack. Or, for example, the word bimba in Sanskrit means an image, a visible image, then pratibimba means a reflection, a counter image. And so prati has a sense of a, a, a counter going back the other way. And it means other things also, but that's the relevant sense here. And so ahara means uh, sort of. It's almost like what we would call nowadays consuming, like being a consumer. Because uh, ahara from the, from the verb to take and sort of sort of taking things in for yourself. And uh, in this case, what it's referring to in the relevant yoga sense is that our senses, to quote the Gita, are kind of like roaming about. And because our eyes, you know, we're looking for things that please our eyes, something that we consider beautiful or or interesting or enticing. And we're also, you know, our ears are listening for sounds that are pleasing to us, sense of touch, smell, taste, and everything. We all know about taste, you know. So um, that's why I got a place just near Trader Joe's. Anyway, so, so Krishna describes this in Bhagavad Gita, Indriyanang hi charatam, that the senses are sort of roving about, roaming about to consume sense objects. In, in that sense, we consume sounds, sights, tastes, smells, and touches. And so and that's ahara. So pratyahara means that instead of the consciousness going out into the world, you know, sort of shopping for sense objects, that you bring the consciousness back within. Prati, back, counter, counter movement. You bring the consciousness back within. And the next thing, dharana, is just sort of hold on, you know, holding on because, because our consciousness is habituated to, to go out into the world, you know, roaming around, shopping for pleasing sensations. And so when you bring it back in, it, it's kind of going to bounce back out again by force of habit. And so therefore, the next one is dharana, like hold on, try to keep your consciousness inward. So the word dharana which I've explained, it also comes from an interesting Sanskrit root from which you also get the word dharma. And so if you're wondering, you know, where's the connection here? Because dharma is a set of principles, a set of rules that sustain a, uh, a particular identity in the world, that hold on to you. For example, there are, there are specific dharmas or sacred duties for people that rule countries. And that's called Raja Dharma, the you know, royal or Raja, the Dharma of rulers. And then there is, uh, 
dharmas for all different things. There's dharma for celibate students, for married people, for people, couples who've raised their children and who are retiring. The idea is that when they were young, they should have learned to practice spirituality. Then there's marriage, there's so many duties, raising children, paying for it all. And so then once the children are grown, uh, a couple has the, uh, the luxury of again returning to their intense spiritual life. So that's Vanaprastha and then Sanyas Renunciation. So each one of these orders has, has their own dharma. And uh, also there's dharma not only for, for rulers, there's dharma for teachers, dharma for merchants or people that do business, capitalists or you know, people that do business, there's dharma for workers, for artisans, for everyone. And so it's all these dharmas. But all these dharmas actually pertain to the kind of body you have in this life. You know, because you have different, we, we all have different inclinations, propensity. Someone's artistic, someone wants to make a deal, someone's an intellectual, someone's an athlete. So we have all these different natures, and there's dharma for different natures, but they sort of, what they do is they allow us to use our bodies, they allow us to, to engage our bodies actively in the world, but we remain within spiritual principles, so we don't do anything that's going to sabotage our ultimate project, which is enlightenment. So the word dharma comes from the same root as the word dharana. So it's like holding that inward focus. And then uh, dhyana, then you can meditate. It's very interesting that meditation is actually number seven on the big board. You know, it's number seven. So you've done all this other stuff, and then you get to meditation. And then, of course, samadhi, which is when you achieve uh, complete focus in meditation. The word samadhi is interesting. It's actually composed of three linguistic elements in Sanskrit, which are sam, a, and di. Sam is, uh, means complete or full, and we have an English still from the Greek because ancient Greek and Sanskrit are close. And so the Greeks pronounced sum, soon, and they spelled it S-Y-N. So like words like synthesis, the together thesis, or symbiotic, when you get different life forms working together, coming together to make a complete activity. So, so our S-Y-N uh, is just Sanskrit S-A-M, as in samadhi. And then A means intensely, and D means placing. So placing the mind fully and intensely in, in the right object, which is ultimately the absolute truth. So anyway, that's a word on yoga. So even though, uh, and, and it actually took a very long time. Yogis would meditate for a lifetime and, and they would often go up into the mountains uh, to get away from anything. So we're not really gonna go up in the mountains alone, most of us, and in the, Him the Himalayas, Himalaya, which means the cold place, the freezing place, the Himalaya. And so we're probably not gonna do that. We're probably not even gonna give up our you know, our cellular devices, our computers. So, but the spirit of it is, the spirit of it is, if you go back to these eight different stages of yoga, the spirit of it is that to lead a virtuous life, a moral life, a good life, you never consciously harm anyone and you never consciously harm yourself. And in that way, it makes you peaceful because virtue brings peace and satisfaction. And, uh, then being steady because even even the idea of asana of sitting even if we can't sit for like eight hours a day or ten hours a day as the yogis did um we can be steady the sanskrit word by the way asana it means not only sitting or a seat it also comes from the verb it comes from the verb as which also means to be steady in something to actually stick to something that's also as it's even used as an auxiliary verb too much information. It's also used, I'll say like, like it said that, uh, to say that someone keeps on doing something, they'll use the auxiliary verb instead of keep on, they'll use as stay. So we can be steady in our determination. And one way we can control our breathing is that uh, not to just engage in frivolous or just useless conversations. To really try to uh, practice yoga of speech by saying things that are true. Actually, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says there are three 
qualities to virtuous speech, which are to speak what is true, satyam, to speak what is beneficial, and to speak what is pleasing. I mean, you can say something that's true, but it may offend everyone in the room and it may be trivial. Like, you know, I just counted the leaves on that bush out there. Do you all want to know how many leaves there are? That's no, it's, it's kind of a trivial factoid. So Krishna says, say what is true, but also what is beneficial. Something that's true, but also beneficial and say it in a way that people can actually hear it. So that's how we control our breath. Even if we do pranayama all day, uh, we can control the breath by using the breath to speak what is true, beneficial and, and, and agreeable. And then uh, there is a pratyahara. So how do we draw consciousness within all the time when we can't, perhaps we don't have the luxury of sitting down away from everyone, away from society and just meditating all day. Um, we can try to pull our consciousness back from gross material things, materialistic things, vulgar things, things that really are, are have no, provide no real benefit to ourselves or others. Try to focus on, try to focus your consciousness on activities, on just subject matters which are beneficial to you, which actually enhance your life spiritually and don't degrade it and so on. So in that way we can keep our consciousness, pull it back from, because as you all know, this is no surprise to anyone, we live in quite a vulgar world and uh, it's, with sort of rampant collective narcissism. And so, yeah, we can, we can pull our consciousness away from that, but only if we engage our consciousness actively in something positive, because we can't stop the mind. And so the secret to controlling the mind, controlling consciousness is to keep it fixed in something positive, something beneficial, something spiritual. And then, of course, meditation and, and ditto. You can kind of guess the rest of it. So uh, just because I, you know, we don't want to give any refunds, so I better explain the topic tonight, which is, <laughs> you know, the, the challenges, the challenges of, um, of practicing spiritual life in this age. So in any age, the way Krishna lays it out in the Bhagavad Gita is that um, and it's pretty self-evident that um, we basically are pursuing pleasure and trying to avoid pain. And so anything which displeases us, or it may actually be very displeasing or disturbing or painful, or simply we may find it obnoxious or, or yuck, or, or just not interested in that. And so we're avoiding things that bore us, that, that pain us, that, that just we don't like. And we are pursuing objects and people that give us pleasure. And that's basically all we do. You think about it, you, know, you go to school, you go to college. I mean, why? Because you think you'll be able to enjoy the world more if you go to college rather than not going to college. Or stop at a red light. Why? Because if I don't, uh, you know, someone may crash into me and that could ruin my whole day. So, so really, if you think about it, we're always pursuing pleasure and trying to avoid displeasure or pain. And so why? You could say, why do we do that? Is that just natural? And what does, it even, what does it even mean to say it's natural? Why? Because you could say, well, you know, the stock answer of the materialist philosophers is, well, we were wired that way by blind evolution. But actually, we can see some things that are not immediately pleasing, uh, but they're good for us, like certain kinds of medicine or taking a good lesson. Or sometimes people correct us and our ego is screaming, you can't tell me that, but the person's actually giving us good advice. So there's lots of things which in the beginning are not pleasing, but they are really good for us and make us healthier and stronger. And there's, my God, I mean, you can't count all the things that seem pleasurable, but sort of mess us up, you know, not to speak of, you know, drug addiction. And there's all kinds of, you know, gambling addiction, sex addictions, this one, that one, or, you know, food, junk food, which is, you know, made to be tasty as it destroys you. So, so there are a lot of things out there that give you pleasure, but they're not good for you. So it's not that evolution 
uh, I can't help just throwing this in. In the last 10 or 20 years, there's been really what you have to call a revolution in microbiology. And uh, scientists are discovering that your body is like exponentially more sophisticated, more, the technology is more advanced, it's more complex than anything they ever imagined before. Even if, you know, 20, 30 years ago, not to speak of 100 years ago, the notion people had of how the body works is now just trivial. I mean, I mean, the body is like exponentially more advanced in technology. It's far more advanced than the most sophisticated supercomputers. I mean, there's little motors inside cells and there's like, I mean, I mean, every cell in your body is practically like a fully digitized Amazon distribution center. <laughs> and, and as you know, Amazon is daily making the world a better place. So, <laughs> so therefore the idea that it just, it happened by itself is, is actually seeming more and more absurd. And there's actually more and more prominent scientists who teach at the best schools and who are not religious who are saying that this old simplistic idea that it just happened by itself is like, not really. And this is going on, it's actually, it's breaking out everywhere. It's breaking out among microbiologists, among philosophers of the mind, among neurologists. There's really, I mean, you know, things in, in historical time, things move at a different speed. There's like, there's like geologic time, geological time, which, you know, is, is relatively slow. There's you know, the time that, let's say, major historical events take place. Sometimes they're sudden, sometimes they just take place over decades. And you sort of have to be trained, you know, <laughs> as an observer of history to catch this. But, but there's absolutely no question for anyone that has any familiarity with intellectual history that we are living in a time, great revolution. And I just, I get this Harvard, I get all this, these Harvard digital gazettes and newsletters and um, they are, really good at fundraising. I mean, they they do not let you forget your <laughs> alma mater. But they do have interesting articles also. And so I just, I just got one today, which is very interesting, that um, it's, it, 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 was, it was written by this prominent psychology professor saying there's been this revolution in the attitude of psychology towards religion. It, it, it's completely changed. I'm just throwing this stuff in because, I don't know, because you're too polite to stop me. So, but the idea is that if, if you look at how psychology began, psychology began practically as a, as a declaration of war against religion in the figure of your friend and mine, Sigmund Freud. Because, I mean, just, very, very briefly, then I'll get back to the other stuff, but very, very briefly, um, with the collapse of the classical world, the Greco-Roman pagan world, and pagans, I mean, they certainly did some bad things, but they had a lot of really cool things also, like religious tolerance and religious syncretism, like saying, well, we're all worshiping the same God. Egyptians have an Egyptian name for God or a particular God, and, you know, the Greeks have their name, the Romans have their name, and the and the other people, Persians have their name for it. Babylonians have a different name, but we're all worshiping the same thing, right? Because it's a universal truth. That's very healthy. It's kind of come back now, but so um, with the collapse of that sort of classic, classical consensus about freedom of religion, Alexander, by the way, you know, in addition to being an incredibly violent young general, he, uh, he actually wanted to unite the world. He had this idea of one world, and that's why he married an Asian when he invaded Asia. Uh, he, he married an Asian princess, and he actually asked his generals to marry Asian girls because he wanted to unite these two great cultures, Europe and, and the East. And he very much believed, of course, in this religious syncretism, that we're all really worshiping the same thing, different names, maybe different stories, but there, there's a great universal truth. Also called, it was called in, in, in the in mid, medieval Europe and Renaissance, the Philosophia Perennia, the idea that there's a perennial, there's a universal wisdom that different cultures tap into in different ways, but it's, it's really, we're all drinking from the same well. So 
anyway, then things changed, and uh, anyway, I'll try to be really nice about this. But a, a, a really heavy religious fanaticism took over Europe, and uh, the Roman Empire fell. It fell, actually, as a Christian empire, but then uh, Charlemagne kind of reorganized Europe, stopped the chaos, and if you didn't agree with his religious views, he would express his displeasure by killing you. So by force, they and so you have all this religious fantasy. You all know. You all know the list. I don't. You know the the, the Inquisitions, the Crusades, this, that, the other thing. And it was really pretty awful. If you actually read the, the history, it, it, it's probably worse than you think. And. Um, so then when, when you get into the modern age, you know, the scientific revolution and then the, you know, the enlightenment. And so the intellectuals in the West start thinking actually religion, you know, was, was horrible. It, because even as science was emerging, there was, you know, the church was watching like a hawk and you, you know, so even as late as, you know, the 1600s, you still, even after Newton, after Newton had proved that before that the church was officially committed to uh, sort of this ancient astronomy, which everyone now knew wasn't true, and which was geocentric, the earth is the center. And so you have the scientific revolution, you have, uh, you know, heliocentrism. Um, my God, it starts with a C. Poor guy, I forgot his name. Copernicus, Copernicus yeah. You know Copernicus and all these people, and 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 the church sort of steps in and and is just like smashing these things. So so the church kind of became perceived by intellectuals, especially in France, because the conditions there uh, as sort of the enemy of science, the enemy of progress, the enemy of just of knowledge, the enemy of a good life. And uh, that's why when you have the French Revolution, they want to kill the priests. And they actually did kill the priest. So, but what I mean to say is once the world became secular and the world was no longer controlled by churches, it was payback time. And so you have what historians call the battle thesis or the war thesis, which is that leading intellectuals in Europe saw religion as the enemy, the enemy of progress, the enemy of reason because of the history. It, it was like a pendulum swing. And so, just to give you a few names, uh, your friend and mine, Karl Marx, who said that uh, religion is an opiate, it's a drug that makes people stupid. And the reason that people are not, you know, basically becoming Marxists is because uh, they've been stupefied, they've been made crazy by this drug of religion. And then you have uh, Gibbons, the great historian Gibbons, because at that time, I don't want to go into the, there's so many details of the whole history, but people started to reject religion and rejecting it. They said, well, actually, this is, you know, Christianity and Judaism. They're just mid, they're Middle Eastern religions. We're Europeans. Why are we following this Middle Eastern fanaticism? And so they started to really look back to the Greco Roman world. The French Revolution, they used to wear togas sometimes. They changed the names of the months to, back to Roman names. They were really into this classical world, getting back to our European roots. That, by the way, is that's actually, uh, anyway, I won't go into Hitler. But so Gibbon says, why did the great Roman Empire fall? You know, despite all its faults, it was, um, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was culturally very sophisticated. They had amazing intellectuals, philosophers, artists. It, it was really, you know, apart from technology, it was a very advanced world, the ancient world. And so he says, well, it fell because it became Christian. You know, Christianity destroyed the civilization. Marx says it's just this terrible drug. And then you get Freud that says that, um, that religion is a mental disorder. You know, if you believe in God, it's just, you know, you have a mental, you know, you, it's psychopathology. <clears throat> so the reason I mention this is because everyone's jumping in. It's a dog pile on religion. And so therefore this Harvard article, which I, I just read today was very interesting because it's like, if you know how a pendulum works, if you know how a pendulum works, you know, as far as you pull it to one side, it goes exactly that far to the other side. And so because religion lost its power a long time ago in the West, 
and no longer can, you know, burn people at the stake and no longer can tell scientists what they can think and not think. And so therefore, it's not going so far the other side. So there's, so now psychology is rethinking religion. Wait a second. Religion not, is, isn't just a, a psychopathology, as Freud said. It's actually uh, a very positive, healthy thing. And that if people have faith, if people believe in this or that, we can engage that and use it to, to bring them to mental health. And there's all kinds of social science research showing that people who do have strong, not fanatical necessarily, but just real piety, real devotion, they actually do better materially. They recover faster from diseases. They tend to have better families. They get divorced less. I mean, it's interesting. Again, these are percentages, not absolute numbers. Anyway, so why did I get into all that? So, uh, we have the freedom now to pursue, to pursue spiritual life. Okay, here's the point, because just as there was this anti-religious thing, there, there's another effect, pendulum swing from the past, which I think is actually makes it harder to advance spiritually. And that is because, and this is kind of relevant to what we're talking about now, just talking about general spirituality. And that is because uh, in the past, you had these very fanatical religions, like, you know, it's my way or the lake of fire. So you have this huge reaction against that, and which includes a reaction against any teaching which claims to have a highest truth. Because, and so what you get is this, as you know, I think it's Newton's third law of motion that uh, any action produces an equal and opposite reactions. So you get this religious fanaticism, this is the only way, and you get an equally fanatical reaction that there is no highest truth. In fact, if anyone claims to have a highest truth, they're not only being very impolite, but they're delusional. Even if, even if a claim of highest truth is made non-fanatically, in other words, saying, yes, what you're doing is also good. You also have a truth. You also are serving the same God, but here's additional information. This is an advanced set of facts about God. So it's not fanatical, it's philosophical. And actually there is, there's an important distinction to be made between tribal monotheism and fanatical, and the philosophical monotheism. Tribal monotheism means you believe in one ultimate truth, and but my God can beat up your God. And if you don't believe exactly in my version of God or the truth, then you know, really bad things will happen to you. So that's tribal monotheism. You believe in one God, but it's tribal, and other tribes are the other, the outsider. Philosophical monotheism means that you believe there's one ultimate truth. However, you understand that many people in many places and many traditions are worshiping or serving that same truth. And so therefore, once you make that philosophical move, once you admit that we're all, again, going back to the ancient Greco-Roman consensus about religious syncretism, which was also in India. The oldest Sanskrit book, and probably the oldest book in any language, is the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda says there's one ultimate truth, but different thinkers invoke that truth by different names, but it's, it's all the same truth. So therefore, we can have philosophical discussion. I think the reason India became so advanced in, in philosophy and theology in, in, in their yoga traditions is because they didn't have either kind of fanaticism. They weren't, they didn't have the fanaticism that this is the only truth and what you're doing is evil. And they didn't, therefore they didn't go to the opposite extreme and say that any claim of highest truth is evil. And therefore, you know, to be a good person, you have to say, this is just my truth. So, which when I was young was sort of clinical madness. In other words, um, if you, if, if for example, that's, by the way, it's also called postmodernism, which is the radical, it's a radical attack on objectivity and the claim that everything is ultimately subjective, uh, which is self-contradictory because all you have to say is, is that an objective truth that everything is subjective? If the answer is yes, then it's not true that everything's subjective. 
If the answer is no, then it's not true. We don't have to believe that everything's subjective. So it's really bad philosophy. It's, it's like never say never. So the idea that everything is subjective is just means that someone desperately needs to take an introductory philosophy course. So in any case, um, like consider, for example, that we are sitting in this room right now. Now, if I say, okay, your truth is that we're in Tucson. My truth is that we're in Timbuktu. That's my truth. And so if someone says, yeah, I totally respect that. You, that's your truth that you're in Timbuktu. <laughs> No, actually, we're in Tucson. So also, if you consider, like this, here we are now, you know, we're all here now. And um, so obviously, each one of us is a unique individual person, conscious person. Each of us has our own unique experience of what's happening right now. At the same time, there are literally millions of objective facts here that we all agree on. Let's begin with language. Language, although we just talk, you know, hey, what's happening? I don't know, what's happening? You know, we talk. But when you try to take human speech, just sort of like normal, not intellectual, not super technical, just not stupid either, but just sort of like middle level human speech. And you try to get a computer to think that way, they don't do very well. You can notice that every time you ever get a robot and you call someone and, hi, I'm programmed to understand complete sentences. Right. So, because computers, the reason computers can't really have, they can't go on with human conversation is because it's too complex. They can't generalize the way, do, the way we do, they can't read body language, they can't read innuendo, the way we do, they can't, exactly get tone of voice the way we do. It's like there's one professor giving a talk and he said that in English, a double negative is a positive. In other words, if you say, I'm not not going, it means I am going. And he said, but there is no case in English of a double positive being a negative. So in the back of the room, someone said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, the reason I mention this, the reason I mention this is because we're talking to, well, I'm talking, not talking to the podium, but, but the idea is I'm speaking and I, I mean, I'm confident you know what I'm saying. And yet that means there has to be an objective linguistic domain in which we're literally agreeing on millions of items. Because when you get into syntax, the word order and semantics, exactly the meanings, and nuances and everything, it, it's just, it's incredibly complicated, much more than you would ever imagine when you actually break it down mathematically. And yet we're all, you know, we're communicating. Or the fact that we're in Tucson, the fact that we're in the room, <coughs> the fact that I'm sitting on a chair, the fact that that's the ceiling, that's the floor, the fact that this is the perimeter of your body where it ends and that's the, you know, perimeter of another body, the fact that we all agree on basic, you could say, proper behavior, like you don't sit too close to someone or you don't speak to someone in a certain way. I mean, there's, there's literally, it would be hard to count all the things that we agree on, which are in the objective realm. At the same time, there's a subjective realm because each of us has a unique experience. So this war on objectivity, which has, which has made its insidious way into even philosophy and theology, the idea that everyone has their own truth. No, actually they don't. For example, let's say you're going to Trader Joe's. By the way, they pay me to, you know, I've mentioned them <laughs> twice now and I, I get a free box of crackers tomorrow. So, <laughs> but let's say you're driving to Trader Joe's and you say, my truth is that Trader Joe's is south of where we are right now. And let's say you're not driving an amphibious vehicle that can, you know, cross Antarctica and come back around. So uh, you're wrong. You're just wrong. You can say, well, my truth is <laughs> so, and, and it's true for other things. So in India, in India, they had these ground rules where they definitely debated philosophy. They debated theology, ideas about God, but with mutual respect. For example, if you read a standard history of Hinduism, 
you'll find, anyway, I won't go into the whole thing, but at a certain point, the, these devotional movements became prominent, uh, focused on three leading figures, uh, Shakti, the goddess, uh, Shiva, or Shiva, and Vishnu, or Krishna. And, and, and of course, most people followed Vishnu. Vishnu was kind of like the big winner. That's another story. But in any case, um, the Vaishnavas, those who followed Vishnu or Krishna, had the greatest reverence for Shiva. They accepted Shiva as a divine person. And they all, and, and the same for Shakti, the goddess, who has different names, Durga, Maya, Shakti. Uh, she was seen as a divine figure who was, who was honored, you know, profoundly honored. And the same thing for the other side. For example, Shankara, the, the philosopher, he uh, taught a different philosophy, impersonal, not a personal God, and yet he wrote these devotional poems to Krishna, very famous, glorifying the Bhagavad Gita and so on. And so he has mutual respect. Everyone accepted that what you're doing is true. However, you know, what's the ultimate truth? And so, and, and they did it philosophically. They didn't just say, they didn't just declare that you're going to hell or that you're wrong. They actually, they made arguments. So, so it was, it was a, a philosophical monotheism. In contrast, if you, the reason I'm saying this is because I think any field of life, whether it's biology or study of history or, or anything, where there's no competition, you don't, there's no reasonable critique, you get very sloppy scholarship, you know, people, and, and so I think it's really good for everyone that we, with mutual respect, with, mutual, with sincere mutual respect, that we can actually debate certain points and it makes our minds sharp. And we can, I can see contradictions in my position, or I can become more clear about what I'm doing. So, so it, it, it's not, it doesn't mean that if someone says, okay, we can discuss these things, and I'm claiming this is a highest truth, although I respect that you also know the truth, that, that's not dragging us back to the Dark Ages. We're not going back to the Crusades and the Inquisitions. We're just having a discussion. And so I think because in India, their mutual respect allowed them to have learned discussions. They became very sharp and, and, and they made real advancement in spiritual philosophy because they could talk to each other. So in a sense, I think that's what we need to bring. Getting back to the dialectic, you know, thesis, antithesis, uh, synthesis, which is just the, the pendulum. You know, thesis is things are at a certain stage. And then as Newton says, that produces an equal and opposite reaction. So then you get the antithesis. It's like pendulum motion. A particular position produces its own opposition. And, and then eventually the pendulum comes to rest in the middle, which is a synthesis. So you have this very fanatical, murderous religion, which rules the West for quite some time. People react against it you know, most intellectuals, I would say, react against it. They want to have nothing to do with it, and they want the opposite, the equal and opposite position, which is a type of fanatical metaphysical relativism, that everyone has their own truth, which is also fanatical, by the way, and because they don't just believe that, they insist on it, that no one's allowed to have a highest truth. And so you can see that this... Religious fanaticism produces an equal and opposite fanaticism. The synthesis is, in my humble view, that we respect each other, we understand through philosophical monotheism that we're all trying to get to the same truth and that many people throughout the world in all different times and places have tried to understand that same truth and, and, and in many cases made progress, benefited themselves, However, we can discuss it, we can talk about it, and hopefully work our way up to, a, to try to find an ultimate absolute truth, which doesn't deny the other conceptions, it's simply building on them. And, and so that's the idea, it's not fanaticism, it's actually being a rational human being. So I think that's one of the big challenges to be spiritual nowadays is that you're supposed to be relativistic, and fanatically so. Like people say, it's funny because some people say all the religions are the same. And some people say, well, all the religions fight with each other. It's funny, you get these opposite views. 
the, the one one group, sort of the atheists say, yeah, there's so many religions, and they all claim they have the highest truth, and they all contradict each other, so the natural conclusion is they're all crazy. And then you have another group that says, no, you know, I believe in the spiritual things, but everyone is saying exactly the same thing. I think th what these two groups have in common is that neither of them has ever seriously studied world religions. <laughs> That's kind of what they have in common. So, I mean, it's true that there is a lot in common and there are differences, but, but if you make in, in fanatical or, or tribal monotheism, let's say, for example, you say at this particular time, approximately 2,000 years ago, the son of God, or who was really actually God, uh, appeared in this world in Nazareth, or anyway, I won't get into this academic debate on where Jesus actually was born, but, you know, he appeared in, he appeared in Nazareth. And someone says, but, he, but Jesus was a prophet, and the seal of all the prophets, which is the term they use, in other words, the, 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 the last and best prophet uh, was in Mecca, and he was Muhammad. So Jesus was a prophet, but you know the supreme prophet then appeared. Or, uh, or, or say, Jewish people can say, well, no, Moses came and gave us the covenant, God's law, which, and so that's what a covenant is, it's a contract. So in Old Testament books like uh, Deuteronomy and, and uh, Leviticus, you have all these Mosaic laws, and that's the covenant, and that's what you've got to do to be right with God. And so what's interesting here is that all these events, the coming of a prophet, the coming of Krishna for that matter, the coming of a son of God, the coming of a lawgiver on behalf of God, in the case of Moses, what's interesting is these are all historical events. So they only happen one time. You know, despite Hollywood's obsession with time travel, uh, things really just happen once. And so, Let's say Jesus appeared. So if you believe that your entire salvation depends on believing a unique historical event, because historical events are unique. So if in order to be right with God, you have to surrender to a one time only unique historical event, then people who believe in other historical events, obviously they can never agree. But if philosophically you believe in the concept, let's say of a supreme conscious being, that's the same for everyone. It's not unique. Philosophy, it's kind of like digital. You know, everyone, it's like in a digital library, everyone can read the same book simultaneously. So everyone who has come to this understanding of one supreme consciousness, uh, which is the source of our consciousness, uh, they're all saying the same thing, no matter what historical event they believe brought that knowledge to them. And so on those grounds, we really have to get back to, and the, and the ancient world understood this. They understood there's philosophical monotheism. Anyway, so I think that's a big challenge to get past the fanaticism because in the world, in America and the West, not everybody, but there tend to be a lot of fanatics on both sides. Fanatics that say, my religion is the only, oops, sorry about that. My religion is the only true religion and other religions are false religions. I worship the living God, you worship the dead God. It's very toxic, all that. And then that's produced the equal and opposite fanaticism that no one has the highest truth. All spiritual claims are just relative. So there is no highest truth, postmodernism. And so I'm saying both the, the, the first fanaticism and its equal and opposite fanaticism are, are not really gonna take us all the way to where we wanna go. So that, that I think is a big challenge for us to move, to move forward in this historical dialectic, to move to the synthesis. And, and, and become tolerant and, and to admire even and accept other people on different paths, but at the same time, to look for a highest truth. So, maybe I'll stop there before I get myself in more trouble than I already have. So, any questions on these points? Little academic there, but shake it off, you know. It's like you can get hit by the ball in baseball. They say, you know, shake it off, go to first base. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Uh, modern physics and cosmology. It yes. It could be very uh, attractive to uh, Buddhist ideas. Mm. Actually, postmodernism really is, uh, is trickle-down quantum mechanics. 
I can explain that sort of try to get around to Buddhism. Ironically, because for centuries, for centuries with the scientific revolution, say for the last 300 years or so, people who are into science and into not just, you know, I don't just want to read the Bible, I want to do science and I want to do philosophy. Um, they, they really, as, they, as it became safer and safer to say this publicly, as religion lost its mm -hmm. power, they said that, look at, in science we prove things. We know how the world really is. Look at Newton, look at Copernicus, look at all these, all, and other great scientists, all of whom, by the way, are religious. So, you know, they're giving us facts. And, and, and then you, what do you do? You take Newtonian physics and, and, and the work of other scientists, you apply it to the real world, you get an industrial revolution which doesn't sound quite as wonderful as it used to, but anyway, you, you get an industrial revolution and, and you, you, you cure diseases, you stop people from, from being in pain and you, know, you can go all around the world and you can, you get this whole scientific revolution that spreads to the humanities because they want, well, let's, have a, let's not just believe in the divine right of kings, let's have a science of government called political science. Let's have sociology, social science. Everything has to be a science. And it's kind of like, you know, getting completely leaving the dark ages behind, fanaticism, superstition. And, 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 and so you have all this science. And, and so science becomes sort of like the symbol of certainty and objectivity, fairness against fanaticism, that because Europe, as the scientific revolution picked up speed in the 1600s, Europe was just coming out of a, you know, almost two centuries of horrible warfare between Catholics and Protestants. I mean, it was awful. It was, it was like incredibly traumatic, bloody, cruel. I mean, in, in the middle of Oxford, the great university city in England, in the middle of Oxford, there's this monument to three Oxford theologians you know, learned theologians who were burned alive at the stake by, you know, bloody Queen Mary because they were Protestants and she was Catholic. And so when she took the throne, she informed everyone at Oxford, guess what? You're all Catholics now. And um, because at first they said, okay, because they didn't want to get burned alive. And they thought, well, if we preach the truth, we'll be burned alive at the stake. If we become Catholic, we'll burn forever in a lake of fire. I mean, yeah, there's certain, not exactly lucid, but anyway, that's what they believed. So, so here you have science, which defends us against horrible, violent religious fanaticism, which has, you know, just massacred so many innocent people. It's also cleanliness, right? Yes. Yes. Science. Yes, mental and physical, yes. Yeah, cure diseases because yeah. science, science is, you know, because before, even like the churches, they had all kinds of witchcraft. They were kind of like Harry Potter. But, <laughs> and so they're then like with science, science. So what's that? Like, well, they're like coming out of plague. Yes, exactly. So science was the, science was the real savior. Yeah, exactly, a very good point. Science was the real savior, science. So now what happens? Suddenly science, which is bedrock objectivity, saving us from fanaticism, delusion. It just runs right into a wall called quantum physics. Because up until, to understand this, they just really hit a wall and, you know, bruise themselves. Because up to that point, everyone assumed that there is a principle of correspondence operating between science and the real world. In other words, Newton. Newton taught his laws of gravity and other things. And so Newton's equations and principles correspond to the way the world really is. No one ever doubted that. If there's a scientific principle that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, and then you put a pot on the stove and you do it, you say, yes, this theory or this principle corresponds to the real world. That was called correspondence. But with quantum mechanics, when they bash their heads against the you know, wave particle thing, and they had this meeting in uh, Copenhagen around, I think around 1920, 21, somewhere around there, 1920s. 
and they and the leading scientists, leading quantum scientists in the world. I mean, the big guys. They issued a statement saying that science, at least when they're doing quantum mechanics, which is basically it's the subatomic level. You know, Newton is macro thing. They said that science, quantum science, has to re reject the principle or, or renounce the idea of correspondence because our equations work. I mean, just think electron, electronics, it really works. So they have these equations that work fabulously well. And that's why you have a computer. That's why you have a cell phone if you have the uh, pleasure of having a cell phone. And, but we don't know what the world really is. We do not know these equations work, but they, we have no idea if they're really describing the way the world is. In fact, we suspect they're not because things just get really weird and funny, like influence at a distance, like you have two, like, an, like a positive electron and a negative charge, these subatomic particles that kind of, you know, they get married. And, and so they're kind of bonded. And then you can take one of them and, 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 and put it 100 yards away, a mile away, 100 miles away, and they still affect each other. In other words, if, one, if the positive one goes negative, the negative one goes positive. They can be 1,000 miles away, these little tiny particles, and yet they're still working together. And no one has the slightest idea how they're doing it. What, what do they say? They, they call it spooky influence at a distance. That, that's like the official scientific. They, that's what scientists say. I mean, you know, go on YouTube and look up quantum mechanics. So, so they gave up the principle of correspondence. And then what happened is this trickled down to the philosophers. It used to be philosophers kind of told you what science was. Now the scientists tell philosophers what they are. And so then you start getting, I don't want to mention names of these, anyway, philosophers like uh, Richard Rorty, I didn't say his name. You can look on YouTube, he's a very famous American philosopher, he died. And um, saying that, there, first of all, he says there are no great truths. There are no great objective truths, which is a great objective truth, yeah. it's true. So I was just thinking, how did you get a job in a university? <laughs> And then they actually use the word correspondence. They borrowed the word correspondence from quantum physics. And they say that you may have a philosophy, but it doesn't really correspond to any objective reality. It's just your mental state. It's just your mental state. And so then you have these philosophers or pseudo philosophers trying to say that we have to, that in the macro world, we have to do what the quantum physicists do. We have to give up correspondence. And that's postmodernism. Everyone has their own truth, which we really don't. I mean, you do. You have your own psychological truth. But again, you know, if your truth is that we're in Milwaukee, no, you're in Tucson. And if your truth is that I can, you know, walk into fire and I won't get burned, no, that's you don't have your own truth. So anyway, so I, I think that those of us who care about spiritual things uh, should not become victims of this nonsense. I mean, in quantum physics, it's not nonsense or just being honest. In the realm of philosophy, it is nonsense. It's just, and, and, and so uh, we should not join this sort of de delusional war on objectivity. We should, rather we should try to find out what the objective truth is. Yes. Are there any other like recommendations on how one can further this philosophical commodism? Yeah, it's like all you need is love. <laughs> it's like that movie yesterday. Imagine, you know, what if I said that and no one remembered that that was a Beatles song? So, <laughs> um, ultimately, devotion. Okay, here's another thing. Right now we're all persons, and being a person is better than being a non-person. Is it that bad? So, um, I mean, I mean, if you just look at different species, like for example, whoever says like, "Oh yeah, I have a pet worm," he has an amazing personality. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, I really bond with uh, you know Freddie the Frog, my pet frog. Because if if you look at different species of life. 
as they get more advanced, you know, sort of in a crude sense of the term, or neurologically advanced, or it appears they have a neurological system which supports higher states of consciousness, creatures become more personal. I mean, mammals, like dogs, really do have personalities. And horses, and people that work with horses, I, I went to a physical therapist in San Diego a little while ago, and there was a nice lady that worked there who spends her weekends uh, help, you know, providing, helping provide shelter to goat herds, abandoned goat herds, and you know, she testified, yeah, they're all different. They have their own personalities. The ones that know me better, you know, when I come, they, they get really happy and they look at me. And so, and, and then you get to humans. And so if you see this vector, if you see that as creatures become more conscious, to the best of our knowledge, they become more personal. Even among humans, if someone treats you impersonally, if someone treats you impersonally, you don't think that's an advanced human being, you think it's a jerk. I mean, if someone treats you in a sensitive, empathetic way, you think, yeah, this is a good person. This person is, is more advanced. So we don't want to be treated like machines. We want to be treated like persons. So if that's the way reality is, more conscious, more personal, why in the world, at a certain point, should we try to reverse that and say, if you really become enlightened, then you kill your personality? And where's the logic? And also, last thing, and then I'll uh, stop harassing you with all this philosophy. <laughs> the last thing is that um, a cause has to be adequate or sufficient to explain an effect. I mean, I've explained this many times, but that doesn't help you. Um, things, things happen in time. And just to use a, a simple common analogy, there's a time arrow. In other words, let's say, for example, you're growing up, and, and so it's moving in one direction, unless you're a Benjamin Button, I guess. But it's, <laughs> you know, things tend to be uni, unidirectional, unidirectional. They move through, the, according to the time arrow. So, but let's say you take an event, like, say, in, in medical research, someone has a disease, or many people have a disease, you want to cure it. You start with the effect that there's this disease that's ruining people's lives. And what you do is in, in your research, you reverse the time arrow. You, there's a causal chain. This happened, that caused that, that caused the other thing, and the other thing caused this. And you actually walk backwards through the causal chain trying to find the original cause. So it's the nature of analysis is that it reverses the time sequence. Or let's say some event happened like uh, there's a war someplace. Why was there that war? So you start with the effect, the war, and you try to trace back all the causes, like what really happened. And so the fact that we do that, the fact that practically all analysis reverses the time arrow means that we accept as a self-evident logical principle that a cause is somehow present in an effect. That when A causes B, A is somehow present in B. Like for example, see there's a fender bender on the road and all the insurance people come running out and the police. So what do they do? Take pictures, where are the cars? You know, where's the damage? What car damaged what car? Where are the skid marks? And they try to recreate what happened. Start with the effect, work your way back to the cause. So let's apply this simple self-evident logical principle to our own existence. We are, in a sense, an effect. And not only if you believe in a creator, but even logically, just simple logic because of the principle of contingency. Everything we know that exists in this world, everything we've ever experienced, depends on something else for its existence, whether it's a mountain or your body or anything. Everything comes from something else. So therefore, everything in the, in the universe is contingent. It depends on something else. And so therefore, how do you answer the question, being the case that everything depends on something else, why does anything exist and not nothing? Aristotle answered, he said, there must be an unmoved mover. There must be some being that's not contingent, that is self-existing. Otherwise, how could you have only dependent things? How could anything ever exist? Because nothing exists by itself. 
So therefore, if you're trying to get back, I mean, this is philosophy, this is Aristotle. Aristotle was not a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or anything. He was just Aristotle. So if you're trying to get, understand where you come from, not only as a body, you know where your body comes from, you know, that's science. But if you're trying to understand where you, the conscious being, the spiritual being came from, you must come from a source which is, which explains the way you are. So if there was an impersonal truth, why would you be personal? How could an impersonal truth or why would it create a universe? Because an impersonal truth doesn't want to do anything because you can't smuggle in personal qualities to, a, to an impersonal truth. Impersonal, the, the impersonal doesn't want to do anything. So where did the world come from? How could an impersonal truth create a world? How could an impersonal truth give a damn about you? How, why would an impersonal truth establish an extremely personal, you know, unbelievably personal down to little subtle details, law of karma? Because you could, which even Buddhists believed in, since someone mentioned Buddhism, Buddhists all believed in karma, which is why a lot of Buddhists said, hey, wait a second, obviously there is something like a soul. When I actually, I, I taught the history of Indian religion, including Buddhism at the University of Florida for a while. And um, uh, I, I used this book, it was a little textbook uh, from Oxford. And the author, who was a lady, a scholar, she said that um, acceptance of some kind of uh, survival existence of a, of a conscious person has become a common denominator of almost all forms of Buddhism. The one hand, sound of one hand clapping, that's just marketed for, you know, Western people. But so, so if you're trying to explain who you really are, that you're a conscious person, that you're a conscious person, obviously the cause of your existence must somehow contain not only consciousness, but sufficient consciousness to account for all the consciousness in the universe and in other universes. And so when we do, that's why people who, have, who, who teach or promote philosophies that don't really make a lot of sense philosophically, they fall back on ineffability, which means well, you can't explain it with words. It's true, because if something makes no sense, it's true that you can't explain it with words. <laughs> and I, I was reading one history of Indian philosophy for the just for preparation of the course I was giving. And this, this was, you know, this was just some scholar that said that the people that said you can't describe the truth in words wrote more books than anybody else. <laughs> Even when I was, you know, I mean, many centuries ago when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, um, I remember I, had, I took a course in German literature in, in translation. I was a comparative literature major for a while. And um, the teacher, who's this young German professor, he's a nice guy, and um, we were reading Siddhartha, and he was kind of laughing at some parts of it. He said, because Siddhartha is saying you can't explain the truth in words, and he, he, he uses words to say it here and use words. So th there's a type of definition which has been known you know, for, for millennia in philosophy, which is called the via negativa, which you say the negative path. You say what something is not, and what's left is what it is. So saying what something is not is also a process of definition. So if you say the truth can't be described in words, you are using words to define the truth. And so it's a self, it, it's a statement which contradicts itself. It's like saying, hey, I saw this really interesting square circle. No, you didn't, <laughs> because there is no such thing. And so it's, uh, Kant would say it's a priori, you know, uh, analytically false. And you all love Kant. I mean, right? Immanuel Kant. <laughs> Not really. But anyway, so, so that's the point. If you say that you can't describe the truth in words, you just did it. So it's, it contradicts itself. If you say that it's an objective fact, that there's no objectivity, you just contradicted yourself. So people, you know, we shouldn't try so hard to avoid the obvious fact that we come from some supreme conscious source. I mean, because when we try to reject the obvious, we just end up contradicting ourselves. Yes. 
I have a question, um, kind of going back to your pendulum analogy. Yes. From thesis through synthesis to antithesis. Eventually, you said that it, it settles towards synthesis. Yeah. It comes but it almost seems like we live in a world where the amplitude of the oscillations are getting bigger away from synthesis. Like yes. The polarization yes. is that is that just our proximity to it makes it seem that way, or or how does the pendulum seem to be swinging farther from the center rather than right. towards the center? I see you read the news. Um, <laughs> because imagine someone's pulling a, like, like let's say there's some device which is pushing a pendulum all the way over to one side. And, and let's say it's, well, well here's something. Here's a, here's a very simple example. Let's say a mother or father is swinging their child on a swing. And so, you know, you push the child and then you keep pushing and the child keeps going farther and farther to one side. So there may be a historical force at work, which is still in the process of it hasn't, it's still pushing mm. and things haven't reached their full extension yet. Hopefully that's not the case. Or it just feels that way. That's why I was asking, like, is, is our, because we're close to, it seems that way, like historically, like I might look back, like I'll use a personal example, like uh, it, the world didn't seem so polarized 20 years ago, but 20 years ago, I probably would have said the same thing about, uh, is it our proximity, no, like time-wise? Actually, there are these kind of, these apologists for the present, I don't know what else to call them, that whenever you say that something isn't as good as it was, it's always just your perception, and nothing ever was better before than it is now. And anyone that thinks it was, but you know, just everyone says that in every generation, not really. For example, you can go back to a time in American history about, uh, actually about 200 years ago. No, 100 years ago, sorry. I stand corrected, 200 years ago. I have a friend that says, I only made one mistake in my whole life. <laughs> one time I thought I was wrong, but I wasn't. <laughs> so, 200 years ago, my God, time flies. When Andrew Jackson ran for president and, and got elected president, he was a guy that brought you wonderful programs like the Trail of Tears, you know, the genocide of certain Native Americans. So at that time, the political discourse really got ugly, uglier even, I mean, you know, even though we have the narcissist in chief now, but, but it got really ugly. I mean, to the point where the opponents of Andrew Jackson in the election were accusing his wife of being a this or a that. I mean, really nasty stuff. And it got really bad. So, so yeah, we can. We can have objective standards. We can look at, for example, there was a conservative back in the 60s and 70s, William Buckley, and he had on, for example, what's that guy's name who was a linguist, should have just stayed a linguist. Um, <laughs> Famous thinker, I can't remember. Chomsky. Yeah, yeah, Chomsky. Anyway, so so he had you had Chomsky, who was this you know radical leftist guy, and then you had William Buckley, who was like this real patrician conservative, and they had this very polite talk. You know, they were talking to each other, and there was no name calling. They were both educated people. No, I remember. No, it wasn't at all like that. You look at debates in the past. Look at political discourse. Not always, but one thing you have to remember is that World War II was a great unifier because people really, you know, Hitler and Pearl Harbor really scared the bejeebers out of people. And so the country came together. So in the 50s and 60s, it's kind of still running on the, on the fumes of that, you know, World War II solidarity. But, but it, it kind of waxes and wanes. It goes back and forth. But I think there's no question we are in a period where political discourse become much more vulgar. And, you know, a lot of that's driven by like an incredibly vulgar individual, you know, and it, I think is actually, you know, seriously emotionally disturbed. But, but in any case, so yeah, it's not just that everyone thinks it was better before. Some things actually do get better and some things get worse. Thank you. So thank you all very much. And I uh, really appreciate your hanging in there. <laughs> and, uh, Hope I'll see you again. Thank you all on Facebook.